Again, welcome to Cornerstone. Um, it's been a crazy week for me. It's been a good week, but a crazy week. Took off last Saturday, went down to Nicaragua, been all over Nicaragua, it seems like, into Honduras, uh, and then, of course, back traveling through Atlanta, and then flying back in. And then yesterday, I had a big bluegrass uh, concert we went to yesterday, so just kind of settling back in. But I wanted to share a little bit about my trip, because a lot of you have asked about, well, what was it like, and and have asked, just kind of uh, just wondering what all we did. Um, for about the last 10 years, our church has been traveling to Nicaragua. We work with a ministry there called Because We Care Ministries. Um, there's a pastor there, a missionary named Don Gillette. He started um, Because We Care after Hurricane Mitch. Um, Hurricane Mitch went through that whole area of Honduras and Nicaragua and really just left complete devastation from, from major, major flooding. And so he has been down there for 16 years, I think, or more, um, working um, in Nicaragua. And for the last 10 years, we've been sending teams down working with him. For about the last five years, I've been going down and helping him do pastor training. It's one of the most rewarding things I've ever been able to do and be a part of. It's awesome. This is in the northern part of Nicaragua, very remote, very rural. And so we go there, and he has about... A hundred pastors in different about four different locations that that um, that come together and and he does almost like a mini seminary um, with them and these are pastors that um, most of them have have really not had a lot of education they all have other jobs but they have a heart for God and it's just been great to see I've got a few pictures I'll show you uh, this first picture here this is the group in Choloteca, Honduras that we were teaching, and, and this was my third time, I think, teaching in Honduras, and so I've gotten to know a lot of these guys, and, and you can see, as we're talking, they are taking note, they, are, this, they were actually writing out a prayer here, um, we were talking and, and, and teaching, I taught this week on prayer, Don called me about six weeks ago and, hey, and said, hey, could you just come down and help me teach um, uh, this, this, this past week, and I was, uh, you know, I was just, absolutely, I'll come down. And so it was just me and the missionary this time, um, and we worked together all week teaching these different groups. The next picture shows kind of we broke up into groups with the, and did uh, small groups, and uh, just really neat. We, we talked, we do a lot of different Bible teaching. We also teach them uh, about how to preach and how to lead and how to handle conflict in a church. And it's amazing, so many of the, the issues they face in rural, remote Nicaragua are the same issues we face in churches here. Uh, and so these guys just need encouragement and resources, and uh, we've been able to do that. The next picture shows um, uh, the group in Somatillo, and, and this is kind of the second group that's gone through. He's already, um, he, they were the first group they started with, so after about three years, he kind of graduated out the first group, and they're now teaching the next group, and these are mostly younger college-age uh, church leaders, and it's really neat just to see what God's doing through them as well. Um, and I think the next picture is another picture of them kind of breaking out in groups. And really, uh, really just, um, they have a, such a heart for God. This is actually at the mission house where we stay at in Somatia, Nicaragua. And Somatia is right against the Honduras border, so it's far north. Uh, I think the next slide's a picture of, the, of what we were actually teaching. So if you read Spanish, you can actually see what we were teaching. We were talking about... Uh, what keeps your prayers from having power on the, on the left-hand side. The center is the Lord's Prayer. It's just how the different uh, things we can learn about God through the Lord's Prayer, God's character and God's kingdom and God's provision and God's forgiveness and God's guidance and God's protection. And then the far right is um, what uh, prayer actually does for us and what we can do through prayer. So really um, a great, great week. Um, what's interesting is that while we were there, we spent a lot of time talking to the pastors and seeing what they're going through and seeing what they need. And, and the last several years, because of the El Nino weather pattern, um, they've not had a lot of rain. In Nicaragua, you have two seasons. You have a dry season and a rainy season. Now, we're, they're kind of right in the middle at, towards the end of the dry season right now. It was 104 every single day we were there. It got 105 one day. Uh, it was hot. And so it was really hot there. Um, but the last two years, they haven't had much rain. They've had about half the amount of, of rain that they typically get. So it has not rained in this part of Nicaragua since last June. Think about that for a minute. And if you've been to Nicaragua before, 
Um, Because we've had about 100 people from here go, this is the bridge you cross right before you get to the mission house in Somatia. This is the river, what used to be the river. (laughs) There is not a drop of water in there. There's a little bit of stagnant water over on the right that's pulled up, but it was just a dry riverbed. I've done baptisms in that river before. Uh, So it's been like chest high. And you can just see in every creek bed, every riverbed is just like that, just completely dry. Um, and so they are in an extreme water shortage now. Um, and, 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 of course, the pastors are struggling with it. The cities are rationing water. Uh, so when they do have the deep wells that do have water, they're only turning them on once a week usually and typically at night. So to kind of limit how many people can come get water. Um, so it's just the people that are close by. So they'll turn the water on for like a, a couple of hours at 3 o'clock in the morning. If you want water, you have to come get it. Now, if you have money, you can buy water. But if you don't have money, you're in trouble. And so one of the things we did this week was we actually loaded up some water. Um, we, we purchased some, and we actually took it out to some of the hardest-hit villages that were, uh, we were around. And, and I, I went with one of the local pastors, Pastor Rinaldo. You can go to the next slide. Um, and... And um, we just went out, and Angel went with us. And, and so it's really fun, me, like, dro- you know, going around Nicaragua with these guys because they don't really speak English, and I don't really speak Spanish. Um, but we can speak enough to, to get by and, and communicate. And it's, we just had uh, the, the guy there in the orange shirt is one of the local pastors that has gone through the pastor training. Uh, and he was there helping us. And, and I don't know if you can see in that picture, but as soon as we got there with the water, they just lined up their five-gallon buckets ready for the water. Um, and you can keep going. Um, you can see they were, I mean, just so excited to have clean water that you could drink. And the next slide's actually a video, I think. Yeah. And you can just see we were, they just lined up. We poured, uh, we just filled up bucket after bucket. Um, and they would fill this. And they did not spill water in those buckets. Y'all know how hard it is to carry a full bucket of water? Um, and keep going to the next picture. This is how they carry it, though. There was a little old granny. It's about 80 years old. She walks up, grabs that 40-pound bucket, and just goes and puts it up on top of her head and takes off going with it. And I'm like, and she didn't spill it. I'm like, I can't do that. And she was like, you know, four foot nothing and like 50 pounds, and she's just carrying it. It's just crazy. Um, but you can see, I mean, you can see this village. You can see from the streets and you can tell what type, I mean, this is a, a very poverty-stricken area. Um, and so it, it is, um, this was really hit hard. When we were driving out of town, Pastor and all this, we, we have to stop. And, and we went over and he introduced me to, to this lady. And, and this little concrete area here, that was where she stored her clean water. This is outside, right? She's getting the leaves and the dirt out of it and trying to clean it up a little bit. There were ants crawling all over it. There was a pig right outside of the picture just walking by. And this is how they keep water. I mean, that's what they use their water for cooking, for drinking, cleaning, everything. It was just, we don't understand how blessed we truly are. And so when you see that picture, and, and from people from time to time will say, well, why do you go like to a foreign country and do mission work when there's so many needs here? That's why. Because even in the poorest of the poor here, it, it, it just does not compare to what's going on around the world. And so, uh, you know, when we start thinking about clean water and Water Sunday, this is why it's so important. When there is no water, I mean, when you have, to, you have people that are literally dying of thirst and, and sickness and disease, and even the water they do have has dirt and leaves and animals, and it just... Most of the wells in these villages are hand dug, very shallow. So if they haven't dried up, they are contaminated with parasites and all sorts of animal waste and everything. This is just, um, it, it's just, um, it, it's eye opening to say the least. And we're taking a whole team back in June. Um, so we'll, we've got 15 people going in June uh, back to do a week of ministry. Hopefully by then they'll, they'll have some rain between now and then. It should start raining in May. Uh, we're telling the pastors, you need to be praying for rain now, though. Don't just wait on the rain. Let's start praying. I encourage you guys to pray as well uh, that they would uh, find some relief. Uh, you can just imagine in 105-degree weather not having water. It's, just, it's, it's hard, hard to, 
to, it's hard to, to even understand. So that's uh, the, 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 just a little bit of an update about my trip and what I experienced this week. And um, just, again, being able to travel all over Nicaragua and Honduras and then to see. And, uh, and, and a, you know, again, we've been able to build some relationships with these pastors. And so when I'm there, they, they know me, I know them. And it just really, um, it's awesome to see what God's doing there. So be in prayer for our team that heads, up, heads down in June as well. We're excited about that and some of the opportunities we have. And um, kind of depending on the rain or the lack of rain, it may change a little bit some of our focus when we're there. Um, but that's a, that's a huge need right now. Uh, last week, Randy filled in for me, did a great job, I appreciate him speaking, and he had one of the most powerful passages in the book of 1 Peter. He was in chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, and you've got to remember, Peter was writing to a group of people who were suffering, some of them going through unjust suffering. Uh, they were being persecuted. This was a time during the, the persecution from the, the Roman emperor Nero. Um, they were in a tough spot. They were losing hope. They were losing focus. They, were, uh, they didn't know which way to turn. And in the middle of that, Randy shared a verse last week that it was just kind of Peter's pep talk to them. Peter wanted to, to remind them who they were. And so what he told them in verse 9, he says, You are a chosen people. Remember who you are. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so Peter is just reminding them. He's saying, wait a minute, remember where you came from. Remember you didn't have mercy, now you have mercy. You have something to live for. You can declare God's praises no matter what circumstance you find yourself in. Just or unjust, it's all the same. You are chosen by God. And he has called you out of darkness. He has given you a new life, a new hope. And now because of that, because God has raised Jesus from the dead, we have a future and we have hope. I love that passage and it kind of sets up what we're talking about this morning. Um, my main focus this morning is, is going to be on verse 19 through 25. But in between that, uh, there's a passage that's very applicable to us today. In verse 13, Peter reminds them, okay, he just told them, here's your pep talk, right? And, 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 and he said, okay, now you've got to remember, though, you're being persecuted, you're suffering. But remember, for the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority whether the king is the head of state or the officials he has appointed, for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slave. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. And in verse 17, you just put yourself in this mindset of a first century person who was experiencing extreme hardship, who was being persecuted, who had an evil government, okay? H had a government that was corrupt. And this is what he tells them. Respect everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. And respect the king. And now to me, that's like, uh, uh, it just doesn't seem right, right? I mean, he's writing these people who are suffering, these people who have gone through unimaginable hardship, who are being killed and martyred. And he's saying, God has put the authority over you in life, and you've got to respect it. You've got to honor it. You've got to, you've got to submit to the authority that God has placed in our life. This is so important to us now. Uh, when I was in Nicaragua, right, you turn on the news down there, what are they talking about? They're talking about our elections. And what do they see? They see a country that has gone mad, that has lost its mind. <laughs> that's what I think when I turn on the news, okay? And I look at, the, at everything that's going on, and uh, the scary thing is God says, no matter who's in charge, remember God's in charge. And remember, we submit to whatever authority God has placed over us and that it's God's will. 
And, and that's hard for us. We don't like submitting. We don't like surrendering, especially when we don't like the person over us. He's writing to a group of people who were being martyred and killed for their faith, and he's saying, respect the king. What do you think God would speak into our society, to, society today? I, I mean, are we really respecting and honoring those in positions of authority over us? Are we praying for them? No matter if you agree with them or not, do we lift them up and, and respect them? Now, we don't worship them. And I would say that even, you know, if a lot of people get really emotional about elections coming up and, and we've got to be careful that we don't lose sight of who the real king is. We don't worship our earthly king. Now, we can honor, we can respect them, but we have to realize who the true king is. So in, in these verses, what Peter does, he explains that regardless of the type of government over us, we have a responsibility to our earthly authorities. Even though that we're citizens of another kingdom and we really serve another king, during this time that we have on earth, we have to submit ourselves to the authority placed over us. That's a, that's a, that's a scary thought. And it's a scary thought because I see the direction and that, that, you know, you, we see society turning and the, the directions and the... And we sing it more and more and more of an anti-Christian mindset in the world around us. But God would say, remember, how are you going to live your life? It's you live an honorable life and it will silence ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. Respect everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and respect the king. Now there may come a time where we have to... To, to take a stand, right? And, and there have been times like that. And there's times when we have to choose to obey God rather than obey man, especially when uh, the, the, the decrees of man goes against the decrees of God. And we see that, right, and throughout Scripture. We see it with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego where they were told to bow down and worship something, and, and they said, no, we're not going to do it. Oh, we see it even with Peter when he was put before a court and said, be quiet, quit telling people about Jesus. And, and he just stands up and says, I can't stop talking about what I've seen and I've heard. And he says, we must obey God rather than man. And, and he tells the court that. And, and we see that he continues to go out and tell people about, uh, about Christ. And, but that kind of sets up, though, what well, that's the society that he's speaking into, that Peter's speaking into here. And that's kind of, uh, hopefully we can see some parallels to our society today in that. And so he's talking to these people who are persecuted. He tells them, okay, this is who you are. You are a chosen nation. Even though you're suffering, you've got to submit to the authority that God has placed over you. And now we get to, to verse 18. And he takes it one step even further. He says, even if you are a slave, you must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it condone slavery. And nowhere does it promote slavery. But Paul and Peter here, he actually speaks into the, 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 the culture of the day to regulate something that is widespread. Uh, slavery was not mentioned, slaves were not even talked about, but, but Peter says here, wait a minute, even slaves, God knows that you're suffering and that God cares, right? Paul said over in Galatians 3, because of Christ, there's no longer any distinction between slaves and free. They are both one in Christ. And, and, and Peter is telling you, even if you're a slave, even if you have a, a cruel master, do what they tell you. And that's tough for us. We don't like thinking about that. We're like, well, you've got to revolt. And, 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 and Peter says, wait a minute. God is pleased. No matter where you find yourself in life, no matter what circumstance you find yourself, just or unjust, who are you going to live for? Where do you find your hope? How will people view your life? Can you be a witness to a crazy world in the midst of unjust suffering? Peter says, absolutely. Peter says, I don't care what you're going through. We have to take our mind off of revenge, and we have to think about following Jesus. 
And I'm telling you this morning as we go into this message, I don't know where you're at in life and I don't know what you've experienced, but we have to fight hard to keep our focus on God. Because if we don't, we find ourselves being pulled by society. We find ourselves being pulled by the world to get even, to get mad, to do whatever it takes to get ahead. And so Peter says, uh, now, even if you live your life right, you may endure suffering. And, and so here's what I want us to think about. The first, uh, first point this morning, if you refuse to be consumed um, with the idea of revenge, and then if instead you become consumed with forgiveness, you're, you will experience the grace of God in a powerful way. That phrase, I want us just to think about that for a minute. If we can get over the fact that we should get revenge and we should get even, you will experience God in a way you have never experienced him before. No matter what the circumstance, you can do it patiently, you can follow Christ, and you can live your life focused on him. And what happens is when someone does something against us, when we feel hurt, when we feel wrong, when we feel like life has treated us unfairly, this is what we do. First, we, we, we feel that we feel wrong, we feel hurt, and then we start getting angry about it. I can't believe this has happened to me. I'm living my life for you, God, and then this happens? So we get angry at first. We get fearful. We start getting bitter. And we start, just, we start thinking about it and thinking about it, and it starts growing. And then it turns into hatred against that person or against that company or against that uh, whatever it is, against that church, whatever's happened in your life. And, and you start getting hatred. And then if you don't deal with the hatred, it turns into revenge. How am I going to get even? And you think, oh, I don't really think about revenge. I mean, we think about it before you even realize it. When someone cuts you off in traffic, how many of you say, watch this? And you hit the, you know, accelerator and you're like, watch this. I'm going to show them who, you know. Or, or you, just, you, you just immediately think, how am I going to get even? How am I going to do it? Or someone says something and you're immediately, you're quick-witted and you got that, ooh, you got that snappy comeback. See, we like getting even. I mean, we, do, we don't even realize that we do it each and every day that, that when somebody wrongs us, we're like, you can't do that to me. You don't know who you're talking to. And we get mad and we kind of, you know, we kind of build ourselves up. And, and this is where Jesus says, wait a minute, I've called you to be different. I've called you to be holy, to be set apart from sin and to be set apart from my work. You are to be different from the world around you. Now, I, I mentioned in Nicaragua, I was talking about prayer and talking about the Lord's prayer. And we got to that part of the prayer, Lord, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And, and, you know, I got to the point, I started asking some questions. I started seeing some hands go up, and I'm like, okay. It, when you have questions, it's always, it, it's crazy, some of the questions you get. And so the questions are, okay, Pastor, uh, what if I have a friend who um, is mad at somebody, and they hadn't talked to them in years? And I'm like, have you, are you, and, he, and like one pastor, I have a friend who um, has not talked to their sister in like four years, and is that a problem? I'm like, what do you think? First of all, it's not your friend, it's you, right? <laughs> and then secondly, do you think that that hinders your prayer life? Absolutely. When we refuse to forgive other people, it, 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 it impacts our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so Jesus understands that. He gives us these crazy commands that we look at and we think, can we really live like this? Luke 6, 28, right? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. We want to we curse those who hurt us, right? We don't want to bless them. I mean, somebody does something evil to you or wrongs you or steals something for you, you don't go up to them. Can I just pray a, a prayer of blessing over your life? That's not how we operate. But in the kingdom of God, that's how we should operate. 
Matthew chapter 5, right after the Beatitudes, right after Jesus flips everything upside down that we think and understand about our relationships and about society, he says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all th- sorts of evil things about you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. What? Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. This is what I, I hope you understand. And we've said it as we've gone throughout the series. Following Christ is not easy. It requires that we do things that are very unnatural at times. It requires that we respond in a different way. Randy talked about training and discipleship and how we grow and prepare ourselves. Why? So that when these things happen, we can respond in a Christ-like way. And so Jesus just flips everything around for us. And so what I want to do this morning, I want to kind of give us three points out of this next passage to kind of help us understand how we can live differently and why it matters. The first Instead of seeking revenge, let's please God and let's imitate Jesus. Let's think about how we can please God instead of pleasing ourselves. Let's think about how we can imitate Jesus instead of imitating the world. Verse 19 says this, For God is pleased when conscience of his will you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beating for doing wrong. So he's saying, well, well, if you deserve it, Well, you know, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. So even if you are righteous and even if something unjust happens to you, God is pleased when you endure it. God has called you to do good even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example and you must follow in his steps. And that's kind of the verse we built this entire study of First and Second Peter on. This one verse. He is our example. You must follow in his steps. No matter where you find yourself in life, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter if you are, are suffering and you have been treated unfairly, and no matter if something unjust has happened in your life, wherever you find yourself, we don't follow the world. We don't follow the example of the world. We have someone to follow, and his name is Jesus. And we can look at his steps, and we can follow him. And not only when we do that, verse 19, or verse 20 and 21, it says, uh, verse 19, for God is pleased when we do it. God is pleased when we endure the suffering, when we don't whine, when we don't complain, when we don't get even, and when we just Keep our focus on Jesus through everything. Maybe you think getting even will make you happy. But if you refuse to get even, it makes God happy. And and that's where we've got to kind of change our viewpoint. Um, it, It helps us identify with Jesus as well. And this is what's amazing about this. When we think no matter what we've gone through in life, just or unjust, fair or unfair, nothing we've gone through in life, can compare to what Jesus went through for us. He lived a perfect life, never sinned. He was tempted and didn't give in. Every situation, every interaction, he always chose the will of the Father. And yet he was beaten, he was mocked, he was cursed, he was persecuted, he was tortured, he was crucified for nothing that he did wrong. But he took all that up upon himself for us, for our punishment, right? All the stuff that we have done wrong, he let himself be tortured and mocked and beaten and cursed for us. He took our sin upon himself and he gave us his righteousness. And so what we see here is when we suffer, it just reminds us. It points us back. Jesus has already gone through this in life. Jesus did all this for you. No matter what you've gone through, it still doesn't compare to what Jesus experienced. Uh, 1 Peter 3.14 says it this way. It says, even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't be worried 
or, 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 so don't worry, don't be afraid of their threats. It doesn't matter what the world can throw at us. It doesn't matter what happens to us. We know who our king is and he's in control. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 1, we'll talk about this in a few weeks. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had, and you must be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you are finished with sin. He's saying, wait a minute here. When we get our focus on Jesus, you may experience a lot of stuff that there is no explanation for. You may even suffer not just emotionally, not just be people cursing and being mad at you for living right, but you may even suffer physically for the name of Jesus. We don't have, we, we really can't even understand this because um, in our world today, we don't face a lot of persecution. Now, we talk about the persecution that Christians face in our country, you know, when someone says um, happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. You know, that, that type of severe, um, um, the severe, um, you know, uh, <laughs> you can, I hope you can tell I'm kind of being facetious here a little bit. We think we're persecuted, but compared to people around the world who, when they're, they can't even meet in public without the fear of being killed, that, that's real persecution. And so he's saying, even if that's what you're going through, where do you get your attitude? Do you get discouraged? No, you have the same attitude that Jesus had. And so we've been called to follow the example of Jesus. Verse 21, it said, it said, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. That word example in the original language, in the Greek language, it was, kind of, it was a word that was used in schools. And, it, and it's a word that students understood because when they were learning their letters, they would trace them out over a, a template or over a pattern. And that word is the word example there. And so what, what we're learning here is that when we're following in the footsteps of Jesus, it's like we're tracing out his steps. Uh, it's just like we're just going back to the basics. We're saying, okay, this is what Jesus did. This is how we do it. And so the first step, yeah, we do that step. Okay, we learn how Jesus did this. We trace this out. We do that. And we follow in his footsteps. And so we learn slowly what it looks like following Jesus. We learn step after step after step after step how we can bring our life to be more like Jesus. It may mean we go on a road of suffering. It may mean that, that sometimes we go through periods of blessing and, and, and periods of prosperity, but often it will take us down the road that he followed, one of rejection, one of sorrow, and one of pain. And so we've got to learn that when we trace the steps of Jesus, it's not always easy. It's not always popular. And it's not always something that, that's going to, uh, get you a, a lot of accolades here in this life, but we can look to the life to come. It, it's kind of interesting that this next passage in verse 22 through 25, Peter draws back, um, he, he refers back to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, there's a passage, uh, there's several passages there through multiple chapters called the suffering servant passages. And it's a, it's a prophecy about Jesus. And it's predicting how he will suffer um, and how he will, um, how, how the intense suffering that he will go through for his people. And so Peter refers back to that here. And, um, and this is what he says in verse 22. He said, he never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. He didn't threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. And that brings me to the second point here. Instead of seeking revenge, what do we do? We show kindness. We show kindness. We look to the, the example of Jesus. Did he get even? Nope. We, we look, he showed kindness. And so what we see, we see Jesus, even in the midst of all of this he went through, um, he said he did not sin. Right? Verse 22. He suffered, he died, he committed no sin. There was no deceit found in his mouth. And we look at Jesus. And if we think we'll escape unjust suffering, you're mistaken. 
In life, you will go through time periods where things don't make sense, where things are unjust. And when they do, we can look to Jesus because he did not lash out verbally. We're good at talking trash. And if we're not good at talking trash, we're good at thinking it. Right? I mean, it may not come out of our mouth, but it's in our mind. And we know if I want you, you know how to give somebody a piece of your mind. Even if you don't do it, you're thinking about it. And what we see at Jesus here, he did not retaliate when he was insulted. He didn't have a comeback. <laughs> he didn't need one. He didn't threaten revenge when he suffered. He, he didn't lash out. He just let people say what they needed to say, and then he was, he was fine with that. It just rolled right off of him. It didn't bother him. And so maybe you're at work and maybe someone is constantly getting under your skin. Maybe you're at school and someone on your team is just constantly um, talking trash to you. I don't know what it's like in your life, but I can tell you I know what it was like in Jesus' life and I know how he lived and how he responded and he never lashed out. And he is our example and we must follow in his steps. That, that means we go against culture. That means we can live differently. The natural thing to do is to lash out, to fight fire with fire, but then you stop. You retrace Jesus' steps. You remember how he lived, and then you remember he has called you to be holy and to be set apart and to be different. We see that Jesus, he trusted God. He knew that there would, he, he cared more about the approval of his father than, than getting, uh, getting even with the people around him. He cared more about what the Father thought instead of what everyone else thought. Uh, Romans 12, 18 is a passage. I actually shared this with the pastors in, in, Nicar in Nicaragua in Romans 12, 18. Um, as, as much as it's possible, live at peace with everyone. And when we're talking about that forgiveness and relational conflict, this is what I said. Okay, let's go to Romans because Romans says this. But it doesn't stop there. It keeps going. In Romans 12, 19. It says, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. So we, first we see, okay, we've got to live at peace. Now he's saying, but you can't try to get even in life. D leave revenge up to God. That's not our task. That's his task. He'll, in the end, there will be payment for sin. If you're a believer in Christ, Christ has taken it for you. If you're not, then that payment is all of eternity in hell. He goes on in verse 20. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame upon their heads. So it gives us this mental picture, this mental image here. Not just that we are to refuse to, to get revenge, but we're to show kindness to them. We're to show kindness to them. If they're hungry, go give them something to eat. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. This is what's so tough about following Jesus. When he was on the cross being murdered, he looked down and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I mean, that is so tough for us to realize. This is the life that Jesus has called us to, a life to live differently to treat your enemies with kindness. And not just kindness, but the last point. Instead of seeking revenge, we just have to forgive. How do you get your mind off seeking revenge? How do, if you've been taken advantage of, you know it has the power to just to, to consume you. You know it has the power to keep you up at night. And the, the, the offending person, they may have done something so long ago that they've forgotten about it, but you haven't forgotten. And you're just waiting for that opportunity to get even. You've got to understand that your resentment, it doesn't hurt them and it doesn't help you. In fact, you know that it just, it, 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 it tears apart at who you are in Christ. If you've been taken advantage of, uh, you've got to realize that you need to treat your enemies with kindness and to move forward, you have to forgive. So how do you get rid of that painful, angry feelings inside? What do you do? We think about what Jesus has done for us. 1 Peter 2, verse 24, the, the end of this chapter. This is what Jesus did for us. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and we can live for what is right 
by his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you've turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So Peter, in closing out this thought, he just says, we look to Jesus. He took our sin to the cross. He is how we find our strength. We, we can live for what is right because we are now dead to sin. By his wounds, by what Jesus did for us, we are healed. There's a saying that hurt people hurt people, and there's, that's so true. I've seen it time and time again. When we're hurt, we tend to lash out and hurt others. And as Christians, we have to break that cycle. We have to live differently. I was thinking this um, and this week, man, how can I illustrate this? How can I illustrate the, the power of forgiveness and what it means to us in our life? And I was really trying to think of a good example, and I got an email while I was in Nicaragua, and I was sitting um, there and, and kind of flipping through, and, and, it, I, I, and, uh, and I saw it was a video about forgiveness. And I just bookmarked it because I didn't have a good enough Internet to actually watch it there. And I'm thinking, well, I'll bookmark this, and I'll check it when I get home. This may be something I can use. I watched it last night, and I said, Okay, God, you know what you're doing. I've got this video. Let's, let's just watch this together. On national TV, you get a powerful story of forgiveness. See, it's stuff like that. It's not coincidence. It's not coincidence I was in Nicaragua this week dealing with a water crisis, and it's Water Sunday here today. It's not coincidence that I get an email um, from churchleaders.com or somebody with this video in it when I'm just speaking about the exact same thing. I don't believe in coincidence. So here's what, no matter if you've been taken advantage of, mistreated, used, abused, you can remember that Jesus understands your pain because he experienced that pain. And just like the video, what's your excuse? If Jesus can forgive, can't we forgive? If these two guys who have a lot to, to be mad about, if they can say, you know what, we need to forgive not just for my sake not just for your sake but for all of our sake so that the world can see Jesus through us what's holding us back I'll tell you what's holding us back it's our pride and so this morning as the praise team gets ready to come back up as we get ready to close here's our challenge will we lay down our pride and will we put our eyes on Jesus Will we follow him with our expectant hope? Would we say we can forgive because Jesus forgave us? I'm going to ask that, that as we close out this morning and enter our time of response, there's some of you that maybe there's a burden you're carrying. You just need to come to the cross and, and leave it at the cross this, this morning and just write it out and leave it there. Some of you, you want to come and just celebrate the Lord's Supper. Remember that Jesus did suffer for you, that his body was broken, his blood was poured out, just so you could have new life in Christ. And we continue to take the Lord's Supper as we look forward to his return. For some of you, maybe you just want to come up to this altar and kneel down. An altar is a place of sacrifice. An altar is where we come down and we lay down our pride and we say, God, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm not going to carry this hatred anymore. I'm not going to carry this unforgiveness anymore. And maybe you just need to talk or to pray and we'll be available to talk and pray with you. Maybe you need to make a decision this morning to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that God is doing to you, whatever he's speaking to you, whatever God is saying, how are you going to respond this morning? I want to give us a chance to do that this morning. Um, I will say, after the service as well, I know um, Brianna is heading back Saturday, I think, to Australia. And so we'll have a time of prayer for Brianna over here to the side after, after the service today. And some, maybe during this response time, some of you just want to pray with her this morning um, before she heads back on the mission field. Um, whatever God is speaking to your hearts this morning, would we just be faithful to respond? Would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this morning. We're thankful that there are no coincidences in our, in our life, but they are just divine appointments. And I believe each person was here this morning for a divine appointment. That you have spoken into our life. You have challenged us to live differently from this world around us. We're to trace out the footsteps of Jesus and to follow in his steps. Lord, help us just to, to remember that whatever happens to us in life, whatever situation, just or unjust, that we can look to Jesus as our example. Lord, you have been so faithful to us, and we know that you will continue to be faithful to us. Lord, we just thank you. We praise you for who you are and for what you've done. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Would you guys stand as we close this morning?